the next section that we're going to talk about here, Section 5, Transient Contingencies, and you know some of the examples that Tom's gone through, we've touched on this a little bit. We'll just go through this just a little bit more to show you what's there and, and how you go about defining a transient contingency. So, you know, Tom's mentioned we're kind of the, the newcomers here as far as transient stability goes, so that's given us the benefit of seeing how things have been done in the past. Traditionally, when you did a transient stability run, it was kind of equivalent to setting up a single power flow solution for one study. So you would define your simulation, all of your inputs, your transient events, and then you would run that, get your results, and then have to do the same thing over again if you wanted to study a different scenario. So we designed the transient stability tool within Simulator to make it hopefully more flexible in that we've mimicked what we do with the power flow contingency tool. So we allow you to define as many contingencies as you want. You can process them all to get well not all together, but all in sequence. You can process them one at a time. You can get a whole, you know, series of results. Try to be very flexible in that. In doing that, we now have a, a new object in simulator that we call the transient contingency. So the Power flow contingencies are distinct objects, and the, the transient contingencies are different than those. So you can't just, you know, define one and, and expect to use it in both tools. With the transient contingencies, of course, the, the main difference are the timing input. So when do you want these events to occur throughout your simulation? So, again, the transient contingency, you can do as many events as part of one contingency as you want. Typically, you might have, you know, two or three uh, apply a fault, clear fault, and we have a number of actions that we allow you to define with transient contingencies. So the, the best way to look at this is just to go into simulator and take a look at uh, dialog again. So there's going to be a case that we're going to use. We'll go through some examples as far as adding models again. So you know, some of these sections will kind of build on each other and just give you a little more hands-on so you become comfortable with accessing the dialogues within Simulator and entering data. So hopefully we're not being too redundant here. It's just a matter of making you more comfortable with things. So just to start with this, we'll open a new case called TS9Bus, no models. So we're going to start from scratch with this. We're going to add some models. We're going to add some transient contingencies. Okay, so just take a quick look at the um, a quick overview of the transient contingency dialog before we start adding some of these examples. So again, the transient tools available if you're on in run mode under the add-ons tab, and then transient stability, and then by default it should open you up to the simulation tab and the control tab. So the simulation tab is what defines the events that's going to occur within your your simulation. Again, the start, the end time, the time step, that's all part of your uh, your simulation. And then you need your transient contingency events, and those are defined down below. Up at the top, there's this drop down. It says for contingency, and you'll see my transient contingency. I've had some support calls, people asking, well, I want to get rid of that. You can't get rid of it. There's always going to be one transient contingency defined. So if you add a new one, you can click on the Add button, and you'll see by default it names it My Transient Contingency 1. You can go then, I think, and delete My Transient Contingency, but you can't delete My Transient Contingency 1. If you do, My Transient Contingency pops up again. So. It's the thing you can't get rid of. It's the static cling. So the button's up at the top, just like I went through. If you want to add more contingencies, you can keep clicking that, and you add as many contingencies as you want. You can delete them from there, then they're gone from your drop-down. Um, you can also rename them. So obviously my transient contingency isn't very descriptive, so you can click the rename button and name it whatever you want. You know, just short mine. Again, you can define as many as you want, have them in memory, have them there. In this mode, you're going to be running one contingency at a time. Later on, I think 
We probably won't get to it until tomorrow. We'll talk about running multiple contingencies or, you know, sequentially just saying set them all up, hit the run button, and, and go through all that. But for just defining them today, we'll talk about running them one at a time, but you can have multiple ones defined. You just have to select which one you're going to run. Then to define transient contingencies, the best way is for someone to have already gone through and done this for you, which in this case we don't we have, don't have that luxury. So to manually create them, um, we have some buttons down here towards the middle, the transient contingency elements section of the dialog. There's an insert button. Um, you, can, you can also right click down here below on the table and choose right click insert and that opens up that dialog that, that Tom has brought up before, the transient contingency element dialog. So this is where you define one action of a transient contingency. You can define multiple actions per contingency, but this is where you focus on just one particular action. Um, you have the object types that are available. As you go through those, you'll notice down below here the description type. Those are the things that you can do to a particular object type. So for a branch, if we click on that, you can apply a fault, clear a fault, open, etc. And then as you go through the different description types, you'll see these parameter options change over on the right-hand side. So what's applicable for a particular description type. And then as you select through the different object types, of course, this right-hand side shows you the objects of that type that are defined in the case. So you're picking a particular object of that type on which to apply whatever the action is. And then your time is very important here. So when in your <coughs> simulation do you want to apply this particular action. So which we've never, I don't know if we've mentioned the whole why everything starts at one second. Did we do that before? We've no. Okay. <laughs> and the, the answer as to why does everything start at one second or two seconds is it can start whenever you want. Usually we run cases for one or two seconds to show that they are flat. If they are not flat, you're going to see growing oscillations occurring. That either indicates a numerical instability or something is bad associated <coughs> with the data. Some software packages that we've seen seem to have more of these oscillations than others. If you choose to ignore initial limit violations, it will run non-flat because you've given it a, a conflicting set of conditions. Like you might say, the field voltage has to be less than five, but oh, by the way, to get the reactive power output that you told me from the power flow, I need it to be six. So if you cap it at five, it's going to start out at six and then immediately get capped to five, and your case is going to change. So as far as the, the start time and the fault time, in the WEC user community for PSLF, start time is normally negative, you know, like negative one. And then the fault is declared at apply at time zero. And so that's that's the user base is what tends to do that. Yeah, but you can put it on at zero and it's fine. There's no problem. Would that be a problem though if your contingency action is less than the start time for whatever reason? Like if negative one and your start time is zero? <coughs> It uh, just but, won't happen. Well, <laughs> I, or no, it'll that, happen right at. That, what, I'll I'll write that down just to check. I I don't know why someone would do that, but let's say somebody does that. The way the the way the code works is, it Power World will actually if you put an action on that is in the middle of a time step. Think about time moving in discrete events. If it's in the middle of a time step, it'll actually create a separate time step to put your event on it. So it doesn't have to be an integer multiple of a time step. If it's negative before the start time, I would think what it would do is it would just apply it at the beginning. Because it goes through and it says, it, it's looping through the events, and the events are ordered. 
So, I mean, even if you don't enter them order, they get over their order. Is this event at or after or at or before the current simulation time? If it is, it'll be applied. But I haven't checked the negative event. I mean, there's something that sometimes we do think, oh, I wonder what a devious user would do to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think the user base, the only negative is going to be the, the disturbance uh, start time. And then the default apply at time zero. Right, which I think we fixed that recently with the negative start time, and we handle all that, right? right. Or you've tested right. that? Yeah. Okay. Negative start time. Is that the way overcurrent relays are going to be handled all the time? When you're on a time curve and you're doing that kind of a trip? Well, ev every, every model initializes <laughs> as though it's been in that state forever. So you don't get, it, it'll, it'll initialize at time the start time. So let's say your your current goes, let's say your current is initially above some limit and it's going to trip after one second. It'll trip after one second. It doesn't initialize with any of those timers that saying, hey, I've been in this condition forever, so I'll trip instantaneously. I have a question about the object, object type. Um, so this is a, is it a bus branch model? Let's say you had a node breaker model, like the state estimator case. Right. Is there a different set of objects that goes along with that? Right now, no. This you'll see the same set of objects with that. Yeah, we yeah. Mod we model a node node breaker on the powerful side, then we consolidate it down when it goes into transmissibility. Okay. Right, yeah. So we would look at all of the transient events to see you know where breakers fit in and if we needed to retain a breaker. I think we would keep that um, before we did the consolidation. So we would so establish a dummy bus if it had to actually create policy? It won't, it doesn't need to create a dummy bus. It, it might retain a breaker that would be involved in the uh, contingency event. Okay. So that it goes through the contingency event. Right. Bus. Yeah. So it would, um, it would account for that. Yeah, because power world, the transient is, it's just getting a file from the power flow side and then it just runs that file. And that, so when we create that file to send over there, we know what events it's going to run. So those can be included. Okay, so that's a little bit of the overview on the transient element. Now we need to take a step back with this example and we'll just step through again how assuming we're starting from scratch with everything. Again, in, in the ideal world, and probably mostly what you're dealing with, you will have a case and you will have um, either a DYD file or an AUX file that has all of your models in it, and you can load that in. I mean, you may have to do some tweaking, but very rarely would you ever start a case from scratch where you didn't have any dynamics models and you didn't have any um, you might want to start a case from scratch where you didn't have any contingencies defined generally with the models, you'll have those. So, you know, it's, it's worth going back through this a little bit again, just if you do need to tweak something. So we'll go through just one example here that's on, if you're following through on your slide, slide 11, we'll start with inserting a, a machine model at generator 1. So you can do this from the one line that's included, or you could do this, if you don't have a one line, you could do the same thing through the model explorer. So either generator one is the one here down at the bottom. So either right click on your generator on the dialog and choose generator information dialog, <coughs> or if you didn't happen to have a one line, if you're in the case information model explorer, if you go to the generators table, if you right click there on generator one and choose show dialog, it'll take you to the same thing that you would get by right clicking on the one line. And we're going to go to the stability tab and we want to add a machine model. So when we're on the machine models tab, choose insert and that brings up all of the possible machine models that we have available. Click on Gen Sal, G E N S A L hit OK. And now for this example, the defaults aren't good enough. So you'll notice 
all the defaults, the, the text looks normal, I guess not normal, not bold, non, non-bolded. And if you type in a value in any of these fields, so if, if we're following along on slide 13, that's going to show us the values we actually want to put in here um, instead of the defaults. So again, this is a tedious thing, so we're going to do this maybe once, and then we're going to load aux files for the rest of it because I jump off of that. How did you know the defaults were in that book there? I know they're there because the, the values aren't bolded. So if I type in any of these fields, so I'll type in for the uh, inertia value, the H value here, I think it's 23.64, and I'm already demonstrating why you don't want to have to do this because I, if you can't see the numbers and you mistype them, um, if you leave that field, it will update now the value is okay. bolded. Okay, so, so that's a valid entry at that particular point. It means the user has done something to it. Whether or not it's valid okay. is another story, but it means it's a non-default entry. So that's useful when you're trying to, you know, go through and gauge incorrect data or not. There's also there's an option here that you can set things back to the defaults if you want. So if you've gone through here and you get lost in you know, you, you forgot what's changed, and you can go back to the defaults, and it does warn you, and then you're back to what it was. So if you feel like going through by hand and entering the values that are on slide 13, you know, you can just experience what that's like and be glad that most of the information that you get comes in in some file format, a DYD or otherwise. But once you go through here and change all these things, I'm going to stop at this point and say I'm good. We'll get the right data in here. I'll show you how to do that. If I hit OK, if we go back to those tables in the Model Explorer that um, Tom was showing all morning, um, so if we look at the generator machine models, and then now you'll see in the machine model list there is a gen sal entry. If you scroll over there, you'll also see the same um, bold values and not bold values. So there you also get that indication of, of the values that have been changed from the default. So that's useful. I think we must have made these slides at a time when we didn't have that feature because I don't see any bold values in these slides. That's there now. So again, if you're following through, if you want to follow through on the slide, so slide 13 finishes the machine model at bus 1, 14 adds machine models at generator 2 and 3, and then we add some exciters. Of course, you can go through all this, or if you, if you have to go through this process, I always say make use of aux files. Make use of, if you know, if you're saving out, if you need to save this out to DYD, you can save it out there as well. But within Simulator, once you've gone through all the effort to set things up, save your work. You have several options as far as saving aux files. You can come to the individual tables. So if you wanted to save all the, the GenSal machine models, if you right click on the table, choose Save As, Auxiliary File, that will save all of those machine models for you. If you go back to the, the Transient Stability dialog itself, there are these buttons at the bottom, the Save All Settings To and Load All Settings From. If you click the Save All Settings To, there's an option for saving to an auxiliary file. I'm just going to save Let's see. I'm just going to put this on my desktop as a, a test.aux. The thing that I wanted to show you here, though, when this pops up, it gives you options as far as what you're going to save. So if you're familiar with um, you know, the PowerFlow contingency tool, it does something similar to this when you save options. You can save all your dynamic models. So those are your machine models, your exciters, any of the models that you've created, the, you know, the transient stability options, 
those are all the things that you set up, set up on the control tabs, the, the option tab, um, the events, the transient stability events. Those are actually the transient contingencies. Sometimes within the, the dialog we interchange contingency with event. The save, the results to save, we're going to talk about the results to save in the next section. Those are the things that after you've gone through and determined what you want to monitor and then the plot definitions and then use the key file. So if we hit OK, that saves everything for us and then you know, once we have everything set up the way we like it, we can always load those settings back in. So to get this case where we need it to be, we're going to take advantage of the fact that we've set up these aux files for this example. You can load aux files from various places within Simulator. Um, you can do the load all settings from option at the bottom of this dialog and then choose load auxiliary. And within your, if you're back in your training cases, transient stability folder, there's two aux files here at the bottom, the TS9 exciter models and TS9 machine models aux. So you, unfortunately right now, you um, have to pick one aux file at a time. One of the developers last week sent me an IM and said, why can't we mold, load multiple aux files from here? And I said, I don't know. He said, okay, I'm going to add it. So that's how things get, ha get added as well. Users suggest them or we as the developers are doing something and find it annoying and say, oh, I want to do this, so we're going to add it. Not sure if that's going to be in version 18, but version 19, you will be allowed to click multiple files in here. But right now we have to pick one at a time. So go ahead and click on TS9 Exciter Models aux and hit open. With the transient stability data, we do get a warning. So if you were loading in like a complete auxiliary file that has all of your data in it that you want, you may want to clear it all out first. But if you're doing things in pieces like what we're doing, I don't want to clear anything out because I might, I'll lose my, I pick my exciter model, so then when I go to load my machine models in, I'm going to lose my exciter models if I say I want to clear out the data. So um, click no. If you have an existing model with, and you're loading an aux file in that just has new parameters in it, it will update that. It just won't completely remove your models. And then let's load in that second auxiliary file again. So click load all settings from and then choose again load auxiliary and then choose the TS uh, nine machine models dot aux and hit open and click no when it prompts you. And now if we look back in our model explorer or even on our dialog, our one line diagram, this is set up to actually show us that there's some special fields here on the one line to show the associated dynamics models with each generator. So now we see we have a machine model and an exciter defined with each of the generators. And if we look in our Model Explorer, down in our transient stability section, we'll see that we have some generator exciters and generator machine models defined now. So now we're set up for a, a simulation, except that we don't have a transient contingency defined. So if we go to jump back to slide 24, we're going to add a contingency that applies a fault at bus 5. So you don't have to run an initiation like you do in GE or something along that line to make sure that everything runs out and steady state before you start your contingency? What, what it'll do is it'll run a power flaw. If the power flaw doesn't solve, it's going to let you know. I mean, the power flow has to solve, and it's going to do the validation. Okay. If that doesn't work, it's not going to work. So that's all done automatically. 
Yeah, you could always, I mean, just to, before you started a transient run, if you load a case, you know, you can always run the power flow on it just to verify. So if we look at the, if I run the power flow and verify that the power flow is solved, then at least we know that the steady state case is mostly okay for what we need to do with the transient. Yeah, I mean, but it's not possible that if your parameters were off key or something along that line, when you try to initiate the dynamic portion of this thing, it could ring off the chart and, and not settle in. I mean, I thought that's what we were, we were actually looking to say, even with everything and before any contingency is run, we would validate that we haven't got some generator that's actually walking out of it. You know, it's running parameters. Oh, okay. Well, you can do that. So right now we have, you know, we've got contingencies defined, but if you look down below, none of them have any events. So you can run this, you know, try to run it flat. You hopefully run it flat for... That is the one thing just the model before we ever push it out to where they want us to at least like initiate the program to make sure... Every generator that's in the case that's in service has a dynamic state of file that's associated with it, or it's in a net list of some sort, and that it's not somehow ringing out, that it's not, it's not set, it's settling in, it's not, it's not ringing out. It's yeah, if you, if you run, wanted to run a case with no events on it, that case should run flat. Right. But I could set up a case that's dynamically, that, that is unstable, by pushing eigenvalues in the right half plane, and then it would blow up. Okay. So I mean, if if you run it flat, it should stay flat. Okay. But if there's unstable modes in there, it they they will tend to get excited just by the normal jitter in the solution. Okay. Yeah, and that's that's what I was talking about. I, I just didn't know whether you was actually recommended that we test the system before you run any contingencies against it after you set up your dynamic files. Oh yeah, I mean yeah. Okay. We we do that in our runs by having that initial two seconds, and then we look at that, and if that's not flat, then we're concerned. Okay. But yeah, I mean, if you want to run a case, I mean, it it should run forever flat for thirty seconds. Which <laughs> 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 All right. Thanks. Okay, so slide 24, we're going to add a fault at bus 5. So I'm just going to pick one of these contingencies I want to add some actions to. So I'll just pick my transient contingency. I'll click the Insert button on the Transient Contingency Element section. That brings up that familiar element dialog. I want to add a bus fault, so I change object type to bus. I want to do this at bus 5, so I pick over here on the right hand in the element chooser, bus 5, I just click on that, and I want to apply a balanced three-phase fault. So in the drop-down, that's the, that's the first one in the list, the balanced three-phase fault under the fault type. But there are um, these other three options there if you want to do different fault types. And then the description type is apply fault. And the time is at one second. So we can, you know, change that, but then, you know, that's the standard time that we have set up for the first event occurring. If you want to associate some comment with this, you know, there's an option down here at the bottom that doesn't do anything. Your elements, it just, you know, provides a description. And then if you hit OK, you will see that it's added our, our new action here. So then the next thing we want to do is we've applied our fault, now we want to clear our fault. So again, you can either right click and choose insert or hit the insert button. And then we're clearing a bus fault, so our object type is bus. Again, we're doing this at bus five, so pick the object type of five. Um, we want to clear the fault, so the description type down here on the bottom left is clear fault. When we clear a fault, we don't need any additional parameters, and the only other thing we have to set here is our time, and we want that to get cleared at 1.1 seconds. 
and then we can hit OK. So then we have our two actions. Now we have a contingency defined. The next thing to do is we can run this. We're going to talk about the plotting, um, I think, um, two more sections away, but the plotting makes you feel sometimes like you're actually doing something when you see those nice pretty plots show up at the end. So to do this quickly um, without actually talking about how you create a plot, we're going to fall back on an aux file that we have saved. So if we go down to load all settings from and choose load auxiliary, if you're in your transient stability folder with your cases, you should see a an aux file called TS9 bus bus fault plot DEFN dot aux. So that'll have all our plot definitions in it. And if you open that up, um, again, hit no here. We don't want to clear out any of our transient stability data. If you load an aux file from any place other than this button that's on the transient stability dialog, you won't get that same message. It'll just load things in and overwrite anything that's existing. Uh, that's just a special thing when you're loading from the transient stability dialog. So sometimes you might want to start fresh and clear everything out before you load in the aux file. So now all we need to do is hit uh, run, the run transient stability button that's up here at the top left and it should run and now we get some pretty plots it shows that we've done something and then you think well maybe I want to change something you ran a bus fault maybe you really wanted fault put a fault on a line you have several ways of, of cleaning this up you can I should say Jamie did all the plotting stuff and we've got a plot component that lets us do a lot with plots well, have, we're going to change the default to half to a quarter cycle. That hasn't been an issue, has it? I mean, people set it to a quarter cycle and just run. Right. They just send you know, the convention for a long time. Yeah, the only decision for Power World is when you open up a brand new case, what do we set the default to? And I'll put down a jot down here, set it to quarter cycle. I mean, it's just one line of code that says, what is the default value? Obviously, the user can always enter something, but just like with a lot of options, we know people usually take what's there. But the time step is so prominent, we make sure it's prominent. But yeah, if you run it with half a cycle, and you're tuning, you're auto-correcting your parameters. We saw what happened with that quarter or half cycle. You do get different time constants, so you will be running a slightly different case. Okay. So. So if you're talking about changing defaults, then you know the WEC user base. They're used to at least those who've been running it. The transit ability to run PSLS. The default, the, the start time is negative one, so that you have this one second no disturbance and then you know apply the fault to zero. Is it negative one or is the step I see is always like minus zero point zero zero eight? No, no, the start time for the simulation instead of zero, which is what you have the start time, it's negative one point zero. Or at least well maybe in PSLF now it does show up like a negative point zero eight but the you I think the users generally have a one second no disturbance duration for the plan as well. Do we allow the start time to be negative? Yeah, we okay. fixed that recently because okay. Gord Gordon was having trouble running that. So I, I don't know. That one might be a... I, I don't know if we want to set the start time by default to minus one. Yeah. We're really fixing it so you can run it. I mean, I just never thought to start negative. I, mean. I think we think it's a little strange. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know. That one, I think it's okay that we allow that to work that way, but I don't know that we want to set the default We'll, we'll talk that way. about it. Some, some of these options, we set when you load a DYD file, we set options based well, on the fact true. that we're thinking this person, this is coming from a PSLF environment, so set the options this way. And I showed some of those options before, whereas if you load a DYR, they're set opposite. I always change them, but what we set them by default. 
we could, I mean, if people really want to see a minus one start time by default, I mean, if, that, if that's like the groundswell. That, that might come from the wet uh, user group, Power World Users Group. Yeah, I mean, if the, if the wet Power World Users Group wants a minus one default when a DYD file is loaded, by all means, we'll set it to minus one. You, you guys, I mean, we want to do what people want to do, you know, and whenever you change something, some people love it, some people may not love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really not important, it's like having the type that users should be aware of what's there to change it. Yeah, but I mean, setting the default is good. Yeah. Okay, so one last thing to go over with this section, um, changing a contingency. So, you know, you've you can just delete and start over if you want, or if you want to modify an existing event, you do have some options here as far as things you can type in the table, which is basically you can change the time at which an action occurs. But if you actually want to change the object or you know the uh, what happens, you know if the if it's a fault or the type of fault. You have to go back into the dialog and do that. So um, the thing you want to change, you can right-click on the element and choose Show Dialog. So we want to change our bus fault to a fault on the line between bus 4 and 5. So we change our object type to branch, and then we want to do this between 4 and 5. So our near bus for our branch is 4, our far bus is 5, and then when you define, their slides are written strangely to me. Anyway, I step back. The near bus should be 5 and the far bus should be 4 because we actually want to, when you define a branch fault, you define where along the line that you want the fault to occur. So that's this percent location near to far, and then we want the fault to occur at bus 5. So essentially we're replacing a bus fault with a branch fault that's going to do the exact same thing. So we want our fault to occur at bus 5, so we want it to be 0% along the line because 5 is our near bus. If we flipped our near and far bus, then we would want that to be 100% instead of 0%. I guess that's where I was getting confused. I knew that needed to be 0 and we had that the, the near defined backwards. but the time at which to apply this can be the same. Fault type is still balanced, three phase, solid. And then <clears throat> if we hit OK, we'll notice that now our fault on our bus has disappeared and we have this line fault instead. Now we want to clear the fault on the line. So we have two ways of doing that again. We can go ahead and right click on the bus fault that clears the fault and choose show dialog and change our object type to, bus, to branch transformer. Description again is clear fault. The branch is from 5 to 4. The time doesn't change. If we hit OK, this is going to override the existing action. There's these options up at the top if instead of overriding that existing action, we want to insert this new action, if we click Insert and then hit OK, now we still have that remaining bus action there. If we hit OK to just override it, then it would go away. So instead of, basically this allows you to kind of use an existing event to insert a new action without having to go through the, the whole process of entering all the information. So maybe you, if you wanted this situation where you wanted um, to keep some existing action and just add on, that might be useful. In this case, we don't want the bus fault, so I can just right click on it and ch choose delete and then it goes away and then we've made our conversion over to what we want our new actions to look like. If we hit Run Transient Stability again, if you remembered, not that it's that. So this would be a trip and reclose? Is that what pretty much we're talking about? So the line goes back into service when it's all said and done, it would be like a far end 
Right? It wouldn't isolate the line and take it right out and leave the bus hot. It's uh, just a three phase. The breaker, would it end up being on, on What's the clear fault, fault do? Clear fault will just clear the fault without opening the line. So the line goes back in service. Okay. You, would, you wouldn't tend to do that because you would tend to clear the fault by opening the line. That's what I would think. Typically, you would be on, right. the, on the line side of the bus by fault. Yeah, I mean, you would you would tend to clear the fault by opening the line. Yeah. And if you open the line, the fault is cleared because the, the line's gone. And we do, I think, clear the fault when the line opens. So if you put it back in, you don't put in a faulted line. This, this is just an option where you can do this if you want. Okay. Right. Whether, whether it's the right thing to do is okay. another. Does other rules allow Sure. Yeah, you just have to put another line in here, whatever line. And so then you have, you know, the two events occurring at the exact same time. Okay. Because G doesn't. What? Huh? Right. You have to make it sequential.
code or of, uh, uh, of switching, switching things here yeah. to make sure a fault is fully cleared in the simulation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, does it require you to clear the fault just to open the line? Yeah. Right. right. Once the line's open, it's cleared. And it will, it's pretty sure it clears it inside. It's not like when you put that line back in service, it comes with a built in fault. Oh. Yeah, I would think. What we call CSSE, I think you have to clear the fault and open the line. Well, I think based on this discussion, we need to redo this example and not. <laughs> yeah, that one opens them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So, are we doing the, uh, again, like concepts, uh, make it a small, I mean, solve one, and then the second one, the third one, assume if I have three events that can take out one time and solve. How low we solve for that event, but if I do one at a time, would my result exactly the same? Would the, the would the you know the, the swing and all the, the solution things gonna we could have exactly the same? Well, what what I was saying, and this isn't in there now. I said sequentially apply events at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's like in the power flow, you want to open two lines. You can open two lines and then solve the power flow. Right. Or you can open one line, solve the power flow, then open another line and solve the power flow. Should you get the same solution? Yeah. But you know, there's other stuff going on, like LTC right. yeah. cap movement. Exactly. <laughs> like so you may not get the exact same solution, but you will get a valid solution. My, in, in having the discussion that you guys were doing a simulation of an earthquake where you simultaneously apply a lot of faults to the system, the question would be if you do that and if you if you like open five lines simultaneously, the power flow, the network solution may not solve, whereas if you did it sequentially, it might. So this would just be an option to say, do those five events at this time, but I want you to do these three initially at, at the first time and then do the next ones later on. It's just an option. Well, we can do the same essentially the same thing with the current setup, just separate them by a cycle. So well, right, that, this is trying to get away from the separate them by a cycle thing, but yeah, you can do it by separating it by a cycle or so. That's what, yeah, that's what you have to do with you. But, but I suspect that if, if you know, there's work that you have to do to get that right, maybe it's wait for the user feedback to see if it's really needed. You know, might not, might not be needed. You go through in the, in the insert, reading in a set of data? Do you have any options for it? You're setting a value. Oh, I think we added that so you can change the time step on the fly. The intent of that category is you're telling the simulation something to do. But it's not, I mean, it was added for something I, I remember, I think Jamie was talking about changing the time step on the fly, and that might be a way that you can change the time step on the fly. I've, I, I don't think I've ever used it, but I, I remember we were, we were talking about giving, uh, giving the ability to send events that apply to the simulation. So if you can think of something that you'd want to do during a simulation that would apply to the simulation, we could put it in there. That would so give you, you run a longer time step for the rest of the for the the whole simulation except for the time when you perform the whole simulation. Now remember talking to Jamie about this, and he may have put that in. Maybe because of Jim. Oops. Maybe because of Jim. Oh, yeah. Probably. <laughs> um, yeah, it doesn't look like we put that in the help. We've got it in the. It's in the. Okay. So that could help him, that strategy could help him map the number of simulations to get that occurred. So that's a, that's a good option to have, especially when you're trying to simulate some big events. Right. Okay, any 
other questions about transient contingencies at this point? The, the only thing to is that on the no breaker side, contingency might be defined as break to the breakers, not from bus to bus. Right. So when we use no breaker model, contingency test, well, actually, in real time, our TPA and real time graph are defined by break to the breaker. And here it kind of uh, collapses into the bus drainage model. But it, in the other one, every note becomes an electrical bus, isn't it? Right. Uh, so the difference will be the operation guys that are doing this, they would have to be familiar with the contingency way he specified man breakers and man breakers. He, he have, could have to translate that into some kind of electrical uh, I simply I like that. Yeah. It, you should probably ask Jimmy on that on Thursday or he'll be here tomorrow afternoon. And this is when this is defined, it is in a node breaker model. So you can I'm pretty sure you can specify these on a node breaker. Well right, you would when you're when you're defining this the the way it is now, you would be defining it on if you had a node breaker model in it, each bus is a node. And that will carry through to when we actually do the transient run. So even if we collapse the case into, you know, buses, a bus branch model will keep the appropriate devices that need to not be collapsed before we do the run. And honestly, there there is some tweaking yet to do with the transient in terms of the full topology model. It's just um, we've had more people using the power flow models with the full topology and not the transient as much. So, you know, if there's features that need to be added to that, we you know, we, we need, may need to add some make some enhancements to better accommodate things. Do we have actually bus ratings being ported in in some way, shape, or form? So like if I have a ring bus and I have a trip and all of a sudden an auto breaker and that and all of a sudden my bus becomes part of that conduction path and I need to know whether my bus is capable of handling a particular flow, is that being addressed at all in any of this? We don't have, yeah, there's no flow ratings on a bus. Okay. You want full ratings on a bus? Well, I, I mean, I don't want to overload a bus. I don't want to burn a bus down because of the contingency, but I, typically it would be designed to say, no, that's not going to be my limiting element. You know, we've got, I, I don't know, where I came from, we had old wire <laughs> buses, too. We had some pretty old stuff, and uh, I don't know that it was ever really modeled in any way, shape, or form to where you could know what was happening at that level of the, of the system. And if you go to, to a more of a breaker node representation of now, you do have conducting elements in between, you know. I, I wrote it down to see if we can. I don't know how it's handled. It's yeah. handled right now. No. There's okay. no rating on a bus. But, I mean, that's not saying it couldn't be added. Okay. It's just it, it'd have to, you know, I mean, we can add it, then people getting people getting the data in. I mean, we, we, well, we add it, we put yeah, it in an ox file. Yeah, be careful what they ask for yeah, then you have another field to That's deal not on with. The test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, any more questions? Well, um, from the WEC user uh, community, many have invested time in creating SWT files that they use with the Aldines program. And so the simulator does import the SWT format if that uh, has been previously prepared for CSLFT. 